Welcome everyone to our Sunday evening Sutra and Dharma talk. And tonight we'll begin our first series on the three levels of rebirth from the Infinite Life Sutra. So before we go into the Sutra discussion, I'll again invite you to please join your hands to your heart center and to recite the Sutra opening verse with me. Namo fundamental teacher, Shekhimoni Buddha. Namo fundamental teacher, Shekhimoni Buddha. Namo fundamental teacher, Shekhimoni Buddha. Sutra opening verse. The unsurpassed, profound, subtle, and wondrous Dharma is difficult to encounter in hundreds of millions of kapas. I now see and hear it, receive and uphold it. May we understand the true meaning of the Tathagata, the more pure ocean-wide assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo Amitabha Buddha. Okay, and just a quick announcement. So on the 17th of July, we will be having the three refuges and five precepts ceremony with my teacher, Master Jin Shen. So there will be a Dharma talk at 7 p.m. You are welcome to attend and I'll also uh, translate directly uh, in our Zoom room. And also the ceremony will begin at 8 p.m. For those who are interested, you can pre-register online via our Voice of Pure Land newsletter. And uh, the ceremony will be held on the Enlightenment Day of Guan Yin in Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, the 19th day of the sixth lunar month. So it's a very auspicious day to attain the ceremony. And for those who maybe you have already taken it or you're curious, you're also welcome to attend and to watch. Okay, so tonight we'll continue our talk on the Infinite Life Sutra, uh, the longer Sukhavati Yoha Sutra. So I apologize if my Sanskrit pronunciation is not so correct. And again, I'm talking about a compiled version by Upasaka Xia Lian Ju. Uh, so for those who are not so familiar with uh, this version, you can look back on uh, my first uh, session on the 48 Great Routes, which we just finished uh, the series on the 48 Great Routes. On, on the first session, I had a brief introduction on this sutra, the history of the sutra and how there are different translations of the sutra uh, from the Sanskrit to Chinese and how Upasaka Xialianju compiled all the uh, current five existing uh, infinite life sutras into one sutra. So it's much easier for us to study. So which means that we will not miss any aspect uh, of the sutra. It's most likely that Shakyamuni Buddha had actually talked about this Dharma for a few times or maybe many times. And that's why there are different translations and which uh, some are more detailed, uh, some are more brief and some they talk about one aspect and the other covers the other aspect. So it's very good for us to study this compiled version with a very uh, comprehensive, uh, full and whole detailed understanding on the Pure Land Dharma. And tonight I'm talking about uh, chapter 24, three levels of rebirth. So the compiled version is very beautiful because uh, Upasaka Xialianji also titled each chapter and it's really easy to refer to. And I'll also intend to translate the full version of this Infinite Life Sutra, uh, maybe next year. So currently I'm just doing translation of the key chapters, uh, which we'll also upload to our Pure Land Library. Uh, after we finish the session and you feel free to uh, download uh, the sutra to study for yourself. Okay, so this chapter tells us how we can seek rebirth to the Pure Land. So it's very important. And when we talk about rebirth, the word rebirth, uh, it's probably important to explain it a little bit, especially for those who are new into the Pure Land Dharma or new into Buddhism. So a lot of people have a lot of misunderstanding on this word rebirth. Like sometimes when we say, you know, we're going to the pure land, we will uh, seek rebirth to the pure land. Some people may think, uh, is it like dying? 
uh, even in China, a lot of people, if they don't understand uh, the Pure Land Dharma, they, they think it's maybe not so auspicious to call out the name of Amitabha Buddha because they see people uh, do this uh, assist nianfo, like chanting the name of Amitabha Buddha when people are at the time of dying. So for some people, they, if they don't understand, they think, oh, to seek rebirth is like, you know, to die. This is not to die, okay? The word rebirth is different from uh, going to die, right? It's rebirth. We are reborn to where? And it's also important to Amitabha Buddha's pure land, the Western pure land of ultimate bliss, a world with no suffering and all bliss right, from the Amitabha Sutra. So even for some Buddhists, if they don't know about the Pure Land Dharma, maybe they study other schools of Buddhism, maybe Theravada, and for them, sometimes they use the rebirth to mean uh, the same as like, reincarnation, right? maybe rebirth in your next life into any one of the six realms or to be reborn in the human realm or to the heavenly realm. So when we use the word rebirth in the Pure Land Dharma, we specifically refer to being born in the Pure Land, okay, reborn in the Pure Land, not anything else. We're not referring to staying in the cycle of samsara and definitely not saying, you know, it's going, someone's going to die. It's different, very different concept. And also when we talk about the word rebirth, it does not only happen at the time of death. It's also important to emphasize this for uh, Pure Land practitioners. And there are some people, maybe they're new to the Pure Land Dharma, or they have been practicing for some time, and then they thought, you know, we only seek rebirth at the time of death. Well, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to say that. However, it's also important, right like now, we should also try to have the mindset of the land of ultimate bliss. And rebirth is not only waiting to the last moment of our death. And now we should also try to live a good life, a happy life now, as if we are in the pure land. No, maybe we're not in the pure land, but in our mind, and when we need for, we should also try to create this mindset. What's rebirth to the pure land? It's actually to help us to live a happy life now and also forever. Because the true essence of who we are is no birth, no death. Uh, eternal actually. Why we don't use the internal? Why we use no birth and no death? Because when you use the word eternal, it may sort of uh, imply, oh, there's a beginning and then eternal. But it's not like that. Uh, the true essence of who we are, our Buddha nature, our true nature of the self or non-self, uh, is no birth, no death. Uh, infinite life, infinite life and light. And currently the body we are inhibiting right now on earth is just temporary. Right? So it's also important for us to, to make a plan and to, to see where we should rest our consciousness. Right? Once this body is over, this body is very short-lived actually, very short uh, at most, maybe 80 years or 100 years, let's say. Or even if I give you 200 years, it's not a long time actually uh, in the scale of I say human history, like 200 years or even 500, it's nothing, it's nothing. And most people can live to maybe 80 to 100 or at most 112, it's very already very uh, long life uh, for people here. So this body is very temporary and we also need to plan to see where we're gonna go, like our consciousness, where we should rest this infinite life and like the true essence of who we are infinite life and infinite light. And also sometimes I, when I tell my mother who is not uh, a Buddhist, <laughs> my family only I am like the true believer and other people, they don't know much, but uh, my mother is like, oh, but you know, the Buddha said we should live in the present. Why you keep talking about rebirth? Why you keep talking about going to the pure land? Why don't we just live in the present, right? Like, also, a lot of people nowadays, when they study Buddhism, like, it's all about the now, the power of the now, the present. Why should we think so much ahead? Why should we plan for the future of where we're going to go after we die, right? 
or people enjoy like alcohol or taking drugs and then they say, you know, just live in the now, <laughs> have, enjoy the fun. Right? So this is also like a misunderstanding on what does being in the present actually mean. Right? When we are in the present, right, from the Buddhist perspective, we should be in the present with awareness, right, with consciousness, right? we should be aware of the truth of life that is on earth, it's impermanent. Uh, you live in the present and be aware of everything that is actually impermanent. Uh, actually keeps changing with uh, emptiness. Uh, the nature is emptiness. So all is impermanent, all is keeps changing. And not, nothing in this world is fixed. And then with this, you can be in the present. Uh, that, what's, that's what we call living in the present with awareness. And by doing so, it doesn't mean that you cannot make plan for the future. It doesn't mean that uh, you cannot like, save any money uh, for your retirement or you cannot buy insurance, et cetera. Uh, you can still make plan for the future. So it's important actually for Buddhists uh, because the goal for us in this life is actually to exit the cycle of samsara. And if you cannot realize enlightenment through your self-effort, which maybe 99.9% .9 of people in this world cannot do right? due to the current environment we are in. Right? It's really like the Dharma ending age. Uh, some people maybe not, they don't like to hear this word. They think, oh, it's just maybe your perception. It's not my perception. Right? The Buddha told us what's uh, Buddha's ability. Right? The word Buddha means that a completely awakened person who understand absolutely everything in life, right? who is awakened to the truth of life and the universe. And the Buddha has the ability to see everything past, present, and future. It's not a joke. And also all the causal connections. And that's the Buddha's ability. So it's not just someone says it's the Dharma ending age. Buddha told us from the sutra it's the Dharma ending age. And during this Dharma ending age, it's very difficult for anybody to realize enlightenment through their self-effort. So some people may still be quite confident in their own ability or capacities and they think, oh, you know, I think I can, I can give a go. I can be enlightened by myself uh, through my own effort. So good on them, right? good, good on them to have this uh, self-confidence. And uh, maybe you should also be a little bit worried as well because how do you know what may happen to you in the next moment right, before you are enlightened, what to do? Right? A lot of people, they have this overconfidence and think that maybe they can achieve enlightenment in this life. Uh, it's most likely because they're not so much aware of impermanence. How impermanence can happen in any second in our life you know, in the least expected way. You will not expect and we cannot predict in exactly what way we may leave this world. Like before you are even enlightened, before you even have the time to go and meditate. So it's important for Buddhists to have this sharp awareness of impermanence, uh, to really to see the true essence of life. And one should really kneel for in this Dharma ending age in order for one to exit the cycle of samsara to seek rebirth to Amitabha Buddha's pure land. And one can also realize Buddhahood really easily. And if you like to come back later, not a problem, uh, you can come back. And when you come back, it will be different. You will never fall again in the three evil path. Uh, you can come back, it's like a game. Uh, you can play the game and you can help save others, help them to exit the cycle of samsara. So that is the purpose of rebirth. Uh, to seek rebirth is not just to wait till the last moment of our death. For a person, a pure land practitioner who is serious about rebirth, I, our attitude is, should be like this. I, we should live a happy life now and also forever, I, infinite life forever. And also one do not need to be rushed on when we may go. I, some people may be like, oh, I really wanna go, you know, I'm so sick of the world here. I don't wanna stay on earth anymore. Maybe I should commit suicide and kneel for, and that's not the attitude. <laughs> that's not the attitude of uh, a real pure land practitioners. Right? If you really want to go, 
which I think we, we all really want to go. I really want to go, but it's no rush. I, we go when our time is right. But if you really like, you're so desperate, um, when you're near for and really desperate, you may not resonate so well with Amitabha Buddha. Right? Because if you know that you're gonna go to the Pure Land later, uh, you have this deep faith and vow, you know that you're gonna live happily, eternally, ever after, then your mind should be calm right now. Uh, you don't need this anxiety, this anxiousness. And for those who, you know, if you think you're going to the Pure Land to escape, uh, this is not, not so much of the right attitude. So we should try to, when we kneel for now, with a calm mind. And we should try to, um, like don't need to be rushed on when we may go. If Amitabha Buddha comes tomorrow, good, we go. Uh, if Amitabha Buddha comes in say, maybe 20, 30 years after, right, we go. It's like, you already know you have won the biggest lottery in the cycle of Sansara. You know you can't go anyway. Uh, this is what we call deep faith, deep faith vow and practice. And then there's no rush, right? Okay, so a bit of a extra talk on, uh, it's actually important for Pure Land practitioners and to also be calm in the now when we mean for, uh, to try to live a happy life now, knowing that we're gonna live a happy life after, uh, forever. And a bit of advice for those who I really like, you know, I'm so sick of this world, I really want to go now. I do not uh, do any stupid things such as commit suicide or anything like this. I never ever, I, this is, does not resonate so much with the Buddha's heart. Uh, what you should do is just kneel for uh, diligently, for those who want to maybe seek rebirth earlier, uh, diligently, and then you can pray to Amitabha Buddha and then Amitabha Buddha may come to receive you earlier. Uh, that's the, the right thing to do. Or for most of the Pure Land practitioners, we don't need to be rushed. I would just kneel for, try to live a happy life now, every day, and also maybe tell others to also kneel for, tell them about the Pure Land, whether they believe or not, doesn't matter, but at least you plant the seed. And then you know you're gonna, after this life, you're gonna live really happily after. Right? Eternal bliss, infinite bliss. Okay, so three levels of rebirth. Again, the three levels, it's not because Amitabha Buddha has separation, right? Amitabha Buddha is indifferent. Right? He has infinite compassion that's equal on all of us. It's not because Amitabha Buddha has separation and say, oh, you belong to the high level, you go to the low level. It's not like that, but it entirely depends on our heart and it entirely depends on our choices. It's like you want to uh, maybe uh, get on a plane to go somewhere and then there's uh, VIP, there's econ economic class. Right? It depends on how much you pay, how much you pay for it. A, a bit of an inappropriate uh, example because Amitabha Buddha did not sort of uh, separate these different levels, but because the pure land resonate completely with our true Buddha nature. And these three levels also reflect right, how much we resonate with our own Buddha nature. Does that make sense? So it's really our choice. And because of our different efforts, different choices, so there are different levels of rebirth. So in the Infinite Life Sutra, it talks about the three levels of rebirth. Whereas in the Visualization Sutra, it talks about nine grades of rebirth. And they, could, they could be even more levels of rebirth, but not to sort of confuse us. But so the three levels and the nine grades, what are the differences? It has a different emphasis. The three levels, uh, for those who have studied the Infinite Life Sutra, the Buddha is actually exposing to those uh, great ahas, ahas and bodhisattvas, like his senior disciples and bodhisattvas. And the three levels are more about our usual practice. Uh, this is what we should do now when we encounter the Pure Land Dharma, uh, really our everyday practice, how we should apply, uh, what kind of mind we should use when we practice Niyamfo, what we should do, etc. Whereas the nine grades of rebirth is more from the perspective of Buddha's 
compassionate vow that he will save absolutely all beings, whether they are uh, very good people or to you know people who have committed the worst evil deed. And this is the nine grades are really from the Buddha's infinite compassion that he will he will save all beings. So one may see after we study all this, like you see the three levels or oh, they are a bit different from the nine grades because they have different emphasis. And the Buddha talks differently to different audience and also about different uh, emphasis, different aspects. So it's important actually we study both of them. Okay, so this is from the sutra, we can read it out together. The Buddha said to Ananda, heavenly beings and humans in the worlds of 10 directions, who with utmost sincerity, vowing to be born in the pure land can be classified into three levels. Okay, so let's just stop here. Again, Amitabha Buddha's pure land welcomes absolutely all beings. How many beings and humans, and even animals, even hungry girls, even beings from the hell realm. But here, just use these two as an example because it's most easier for beings from these two realms to seek rebirth to the pure land. And again, it's for all the people in all the worlds in the 10 directions, because Amitabha Buddha's great vows is for all, absolutely all beings in all the worlds in the 10 directions, uh, infinite compassion. Who, with utmost sincerity, uh, what does this mean? I think we talk about this as well in, when we talk about the 48 great vows. So sincerity, you have to be sincere. You have to be real. Uh, when we talk about faith, vow, practice, this needs to be real. Uh, you cannot be like, oh yeah, I believe in Amitabha Buddha. I want to go to the pure land. But in fact, you don't want. There are people who will like, maybe you know, in a relationship, they say, I love you. you know, I can do anything for you. But it's not sincere. They, they can't. Maybe they don't love you and they can't do anything for you. <laughs> so it's a, a, bit, a bit like this. So utmost sincerity. So not only real, it has to be very real. I just need to be serious. You need to be serious about this. Your heart needs to be real. You need to have the sincere heart, this real heart that you truly believe in Amitabha Buddha, in the pure land, and you truly want to go to the pure land. So this is what we call utmost sincerity. And only when you have this utmost sincerity, when you kneel for, then you resonate with Amitabha Buddha, and that's how you can elicit a response from Amitabha Buddha. If you don't have this utmost sincerity, I, sometimes, sometimes people are like, yeah, I believe, but in their heart, they don't believe. That's not what we call sincerity. If you don't have the sincerity and you're near for, then you may not, most likely, you would not elicit a response from Amitabha Buddha because you don't want to go. If you don't want to go, the Buddha will not force you. Okay, the Buddha will not interfere with our karma if we don't want to go. Uh, if you actually want to stay here, maybe you're too attached to this Saha world. Uh, but on, on, on your mouth, maybe your other friends, they are near for, they want to go. And then you be like, oh, I also want to go. But, you know, deep down, you don't want to go. No sincerity, then no rebirth. Okay. So utmost sincerity. Vowing to be born in a pure land can be classified into three levels. So tonight, we'll just go through the high level. The high level beings are those who, so this one, two, three, four, five, I actually added them. It's not in the original sutra, but I just break them down. So it's easier for us to see what exactly are the criteria. Uh, if you are uh, aspiring for the high level rebirth, uh, which I hope a lot of us, we actually want to go maybe on the high level rebirth. Why? Because in that way, we can realize Buddhahood the fastest and soonest if you are uh, you seek rebirth in a high level. Okay, so what are the criteria? The high level beings are those who first, they leave their homes and renounce worldly pleasures to become shamanas. So shamanas uh, in India, uh, the word shamanas or in Hinduism, it can refer to any uh, maybe spiritual practitioners who they renounce the world, worldly pleasures, and then they uh, practice uh, diligently. Uh, whereas in Buddhist 
when we use this word shamanas, we particularly refer to uh, Buddhist monks. So when uh, Buddhism came from India to China, I, when we use this word shamanas, we mean Buddhist monks. So they leave their homes, they renounce the worldly pleasures to become monks. And second, generating bodhicitta. Third, single-mindedly reciting the name of Amitabha Buddha. Fourth, cultivating all kinds of merits. And fifth, vowing to be born in that land. Okay, so let's stop here and let's talk about each of them one by one. So leave their homes and renounce worldly pleasures to become monks. So some people would say, so does that mean I must take a monastic life? I must become monks or nuns in order to seek rebirth in the highest level. So in theory, it is like this. Yes, when it says very clearly in the sutra. But for those who have maybe look at the nine grades of rebirth, it did not mention that for those who attain rebirth in the highest level in the nine grades of rebirth from the visualization sutra. And the visualization sutra, the Buddha exported the visualization sutra to Queen Videhi, who is a lay Buddhist. So why do we actually need to be monks in order to seek rebirth in the high level? Or can we be also lay Buddhist and go to the pure land in the high level? So both are actually possible, but I, there are actually two ways of taking a monastic life. I, one is that you really take a monastic life, like what I'm hoping to do, I really to be a Buddhist monk or Buddhist nun, I, really properly to really give up your family life, etc. So another way of renounce the world is that in your heart, in your heart, you're not attached to anything, but you may still live a family life. This is actually more difficult to achieve. Like this is actually more difficult to do. So most likely for a lot of people, if they want to go to high level, they actually need to be monks or nuns. Otherwise, or you can be like, I'm taking a monastic life, but in my heart. But this is, can be very difficult. This is actually a higher level than those who just uh, be like proper monks and nuns. But imagine if you're living a family life, can you really not be attached to say your children, your wife, your husband? When I say not attached, I don't mean that you need to be cold-blooded to them. Right? You can do anything, right? you can take care of them, etc. But in your heart, you're not attached at all. This is not easy to achieve. It's much easier for people who they're like monks and nuns, they live in a monastery. And for them, it's not a problem. It's easier to not be attached to their family home because they already left. It's like they already abandoned it and they don't see it. So it's easier not to be attached. Whereas for people who live in a family life, it's very difficult to not to be attached to your family life. Okay, so why do you think this is in the criteria of the high level of rebirth? Because the more we let go of the Saha world, of the cycle of Sansara, and the more we are willing to let go and to renounce, and the more we resonate with our Buddha nature, then the easiest is our rebirth. Unconstrained, the more your heart becomes unconstrained, your mind becomes unconstrained to any sort of worldly pleasures, etc., then the easier is your rebirth. I really, at the time of death, oh, no worries, you just go. Whereas for a lot of people, I, why some people, they have a lot of common obstacles, maybe at the time of death, due to the attachment. Attachment to what? Most likely to their family members, maybe to their grandchildren, to their children, etc. I, I talk about the grandmas, uh, the Taiwanese grandma, I, who also kneel for diligently, but with a lot of attachment to her grandson. Every time when she saw Amitabha Buddha, this thought arise, oh, but I want to take care of my grandson, you know, and then Amitabha Buddha disappeared. And it's only the, the third time after she saw Amitabha Buddha, she finally let go and go with Amitabha Buddha. So the more attachment you have to the Saha world, then the lower level your rebirth, and maybe the more difficult, you may not be so at ease when you are leaving this world. 
some people may like, oh yeah, I'm attached now, but like, you know, when I'm at the time of death, I will not be attached. It's not so easy like that. If you're attached now, maybe most likely when you are at the time of death, you will be more attached because we have this habitual tendency and right? the habits, your habits is to be attached. Whatever habits we have now at the time of death, we will only exaggerating that. Right? That will only sort of get expanded right? because the habitual tendency is strong. That's why we keep being trapped in the cycle of samsara. It's not the first time we have encountered the Pure Land Dharma. Uh, for those who studied the Infinite Life Sutra, you will know. Uh, we had already, for those who encountered this Dharma and believe it, we have already made offerings to countless Buddhas in our past lives. It's not the first time we encountered the Dharma, not the first time we encountered the Pure Land Dharma. Why we did not go earlier? Attachment, attachment to the Saha world. Uh, attachment to worldly pleasures, attachment to temporary phenomena, temporary people, temporary relationships. We are attached to illusions. We grasp what's not real as real. And uh, we think they are permanent, but they're not. And only at the time of death, you all of a sudden realize, oh, maybe they're not real, but you cannot change your habits so easily. So it's a bit like this. Okay, so the more we let go, the more we are not attached, the higher the level of our rebirth, the easiest is our rebirth. Okay, so the second point, generating bodhicitta, that this is very important. This, in the three levels of rebirth, you see this in each level. Each level is as generating bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta. I remember we talk about the pure land dharma is actually Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, what's different from Mahayana Buddhism, the great vehicle to the lesser vehicle is that the why we are practicing the Bodhisattva path is really we want to generate a bodhicitta to aspire for perfect enlightenment to save all sentient beings. And through this process, one can get rid of the self. And when you become selfless, you are in selfless service to all sentient beings. You want to help all sentient beings to also realize Buddhahood. And through your own realization of Buddhahood, you can also help others. And generally, Bodhicitta here uh, specifically also refer to vow to seek rebirth to the Pure Land. And you want to go to the Pure Land because you know that once you're in the Pure Land, you will realize Buddhahood. And when you realize Buddhahood, you will have the ability to help all the beings in the 10 directions. So remember, Pure Land Buddhists are Mahayana Buddhists. This is the great vehicle, the greatest vehicle. And with this Dharma, you can truly help all beings in the 10 directions. Some people say maybe they practice other schools of Mahayana Buddhism and they don't understand uh, the Pure Land school so much. They're like, oh, you know, but I don't want to go to the Pure Land because I think it's too selfish. You're just escaping the samsara. I want to be in the samsara so I can help more beings in the future, maybe in my next life. I will keep reincarnating in the cycle of samsara so I can help more people. Well, good luck to people like that, right? Really admire their bodhicitta as well, but also have to be a bit worried for them. How can you be so sure in your next life, you can definitely be a human? Let's say maybe you practice the five precepts quite well. You keep the five precepts well. You even maybe practice the 10 good deeds. How can you be so certain in your next life? Not only you can be a human, and also you can encounter the Dharma and also you can encounter, you know, and you can believe in the Dharma, right? So a lot of causes and conditions that we cannot control of if we keep staying in the cycle of samsara before we realize enlightenment to the state of non-regression. For anybody who says this kind of thing, so I, I want to keep staying in the cycle of samsara, maybe keep reincarnating so I can keep safe sentient beings. The basic criteria for anybody who can do that is you first need to become enlightened yourself. Not only you need to be enlightened, you need to be enlightened to the state of non-regression. So you will not fall back no matter what. You're only naturally going towards final Buddhahood, such as what kind of person is like that? Bodhisattva Nagarjuna. Bodhisattva Nagarjuna can say that, not a problem. But look at where Bodhisattva Nagarjuna wanted to go, the pure land, like the reverse case we shared last night. 
like Bodhisattva Nagarjuna also first saw rebirth through the pure land because he knew that he can realize Buddhahood the soonest day. And so are uh, Bodhisattva Samadabhadra, Manjushri, all these highly enlightened beings, they will all first go to the pure land. So let's not be stupid. Right? Let's be real, realistic here. We first need to go to the pure land. That's also called generating bodhicitta. And sometimes people think, oh, pure land practitioners, they don't have bodhicitta. It's not, and they don't understand. We go to the pure land because we know that once we attain enlightenment, attain Buddhahood, then we will have the best ability to help save all sentient beings. If you want to help others, you need to first help yourself, right? This is very easy to understand. So important to generate bodhicitta for pure land practitioners. And then you may be like, but now, you know, I generate bodhicitta. I don't have the ability to help others. Don't worry. Now you only need to generate bodhicitta. You just need to generate this thought that you want to help others. You want to realize enlightenment. You want to go to the pure land. And that's enough. I, now we don't really have much capacities at all to help save anyone. We cannot even help save ourselves. So just first you have this thought, you have the heart of bodhicitta, and then you go to the pure land and then after you can help others. So this is also called generating bodhicitta for Pure Land practitioners. Third, single-mindedly reside in the name of Amitabha Buddha. And this is also important. Uh, it's our nianfo practice, which we do daily. Hopefully, <laughs> if you're not doing it daily, hopefully you will do it daily. So single-minded means that you focus uh, when you are nianfo. Another thing uh, I like to sort of emphasize here is that it doesn't mean that you cannot add on other practice. And sometimes people are like, you know, can I also maybe recite the great compassionate mantra? Can I also maybe recite a sentence sutra? Yes, you can as well. So in the Pure Land Dharma, we have like primary practice and also other uh, auxiliary practice that can also assist us. Uh, you can also practice like certain mantras you really like, or you like to study the sutras, recite the sutras, you can. And this out, you can cultivate all this and then transfer the merit towards seeking rebirth as well, which is the fourth point. So the third point is about our primary practice, but the primary practice of Nianfo, you need to keep. Uh, this is uh, without doubt, right? single-mindedly reciting the name of Amitabha Buddha, which is our Nianfo practice. It doesn't mean that exclusive. It doesn't mean that you can only recite the name of Amitabha Buddha. You cannot recite the name of Guan Yi. You cannot recite the name of Dashi Zhi. Right? One does not need to understand it this way, right? not that extreme, but it's just Nian Fu needs to be your primary practice. And then you can, if you have a really good connection with Guan Yin and maybe other bodhisattvas, you can also recite their name and then you transfer the merit towards seeking rebirth. Okay. First point, cultivating all kinds of merits. So like what I just said, if you have other auxiliary practice and also include cultivating good deeds, right? as Buddhists, we shall cultivate good, shall do good, refrain from evil, purify one's mind. Right? That's the teaching of all Buddhas. A Buddha will not tell you to do evil. So as Buddhists, we should do good. And then, but when we do good, it's not for to have more blessings, maybe in our next life in the cycle of sansara. Uh, some people, they practice Buddhism and then they think, oh, I'm gonna you know, cultivate a lot of good merit. And in my next life, maybe I will be a princess in a certain country. Uh, this is not what we want. Or we may ascend to the heaven realm to be like a, a god or goddess in the heaven. No, no, no. We want something even better than that. So if we cultivate all this merit and do good, good deeds, what we're gonna do is that we transfer this towards seeking rebirth to the pure land. Or the reason why we're doing this, also, also not, not be attached, but if we were to have any merit when we cultivate good, like all this merit will go through our rebirth uh, in the pure land. So vowing to be born in that land. Okay, this is very clear. So you have faith, you have utmost sincerity, you vow, you have to vow and then practice uh, for uh, high level beings. You should not be so attached to the world, uh, not to be attached to the world. Generate bodhicitta, your nianfo practice need to be good. Okay, for these beings, when they are at the time of death. So when you are at the time of death, 
Amitabha Buddha together with many sages. So for those who attain rebirth in the highest grade, highest level, not only Amitabha Buddha will come, you will also see many sages such as Bodhisattvas like Guan Yin, Da Shi Zhi, Mahasama Prapta, like all these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas from the Pure Land, they will come to receive you, they will come to welcome you, will appear before them. In one instant, they will follow the Buddha and attain rebirth in his land. Now remember, second rebirth is in one instant. I will talk about one instant. It's even shorter than one second, maybe like one sixtieth of one second, like one instant. A really, really short time. It's like a change of dimension. Instantly, you can arrive in the Pure Land. Although from the Amitabha Sutra, we, say, we see the Buddha told us the Pure Land is like, you know, 10 billion Buddha lands away or how hundreds of billions of Buddha lands away, but doesn't matter. Like even uh, some scientists, uh, they start to understand. I think it was Einstein or some, someone else said that actually, you know, time and space are illusions. So in theory, one can travel from one end of universe to the other end in one instant. So they figure that out, but they don't know how to do it. They just know this is possible in theory, but the Buddhas know. So with Amitabha Buddha's great vows, we can in one instant follow the Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, and attain rebirth in his land. At once, all this will happen really, really fast. At one instant at once, you will transform spontaneously from the seven jewel lotus flowers. I remember we go, Amitabha Buddha come, give us his lotus, such as the image here, like your lotus is here. Uh, hopefully very big, uh, very big, beautiful uh, golden lotus. Right? This is our vehicle and this is what we use, not any sort of a heavy metallic, uh, low dimensional uh, spaceship machines, uh, not like that. We, we go in the Pure Land with a wonderful lotus, and then we can transform from our lotus. Our lotus is like our mother in the Pure Land, our vehicle, our mother, and we're born through the lotus with the transformed body, a golden, pure golden transformed body, not like this low dimensional existence of a you know, flesh, uh, vulnerable physical uh, flesh bodies. Okay, so it's like a completely upgrade of our existence with vigorous wisdom and freedom in divine power. Uh, so for those who attain high level of rebirth, why we should actually aspire for a higher level of rebirth because you will attain uh, the most wisdom when you are there uh, in a very short time. You cannot imagine how short everything happens and how quickly you'll be enlightened there from an ordinary unenlightened being with greed, anger, and ignorance and boom, you're in a pure land and instantly, very, very, in a very short time, you will have vigorous wisdom and freedom in divine power due to Amitabha Buddha's great vows. And not because of you cultivate so much, but because Amitabha Buddha vows so, as you can see uh, from the sixth to the 10th vow of his 48 great vows, which we have studied. So what's the uh, divine power, which uh, are all the, uh, so-called supernatural powers, spiritual powers, uh, such as divine eye and divine ear, and uh, uh, telepathy, transportation, uh, everything, and also elimination of all afflictions. And when, when we talk about divine power, spiritual power, or this uh, so-called supernatural powers, which are actually our original power, in the pure land, these are very high level. Uh, even this power, they have different levels, which we talk about it before when we talk about the 48 great vows. So for those who want to know a bit more, you can uh, go through our earlier uh, sessions in the 48 great vows. Okay, so therefore Ananda, if there are beings who vow to see Amitabha Buddha in this life, so what does it mean? Who vow to seek rebirth in this life? Because when you seek rebirth, you are bound to see Amitabha Buddha in this life. Right? It doesn't mean that you will see Amitabha Buddha maybe like right now when you kneel for, you may be like, oh, you know why I can't see Amitabha Buddha yet. But you'll definitely see in this life, maybe at the time of death for a lot of people, right? Or if you want to see earlier, then you just kneel for more diligently. So they should generate the supreme motichitta. So again, it's like a summary, what we, what we just said. 
general supreme bodhicitta, also being mindful of the land of ultimate bliss. So Nianfo is also a way of being mindful of the land of ultimate bliss. Or uh, for some people, they can also uh, see the image of Amitabha Buddha, like prostrate at the statue of Amitabha Buddha, also a way to be mindful of the land of ultimate bliss. Or like us, we're studying the sutra like this, we're also being mindful of the land of ultimate bliss. Accumulating good roots, so you're accumulating good merit, and transfer the merit towards rebirth. I like what we just said. So again, just summarize what we had just said. So for this reason, they can see the Buddha and being born in that land, attaining the state of non-regression and even the supreme body. I remember for beings who attain birth in Amitabha Buddha's pure land, uh, the higher the level of rebirth, the more quicker you will attain to the state of non-regression, which is a very high level of enlightenment. Uh, the least it's the first stage of dwelling or to the A stage of ground. The A stage of ground is like completely non-regression. And then nine stage of ground, and then 10 stage of ground, and then uh, equal awakening or equal enlightenment, like highest level of bodhisattva, and then final Buddhahood. So non-regression is like you will not fall back anymore. You just naturally, without much effort at all, naturally uh, going towards the final Buddhahood, a perfect enlightenment, which is the supreme body. Okay, so that's the high level of rebirth. It's actually not too difficult, but the most difficult for a lot of people would be actually to let go, right? to renounce the worldly pressures, to let go, to be a monk, right? whether it's in the body right? as a, a monk, uh, you actually appear like a monk or actually in your heart, you need to be like a monk. So it's not easy for a lot of people is to actually let go, yeah. But otherwise it's easy. If you can let go, and then other things does not seem to be too difficult. Okay, so let's do the merit transfer together. May we vow to be born in the Western Pure Land, have the nine great lotuses as our parents. When the lotuses open, we'll see the Buddha and realize the Dharma of no birth with non-regressing bodhisattvas as our companions. So may all beings hear the name of Amitabha Buddha and be born in the land of ultimate bliss. Namo Amitabha Buddha. Namo Amitofo. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm just uh, quickly checking uh, some sort of uh, comments here. So Alexis, are the lotuses sentient beings? Are they conscious? Thank you. Uh, the lotuses are not sentient beings. The lotuses are transformed by the Buddha. I'm a sincerity in making vows to be born is self power. Without self power, Amitabha Buddha's vow is useless and also cannot bring us to rebirth. Therefore, it's not really easy to be reborn either. I wish. Amitabha Buddha will also come to welcome us even when we cannot generate a sincere mind. <laughs> okay, yeah, Vincent, yeah. So the Pure Land Dharma, to avoid any sort of a extreme interpretation, uh, we, in Chinese Pure Land Buddhism, we actually call it true power method in case of people just totally eliminate uh, self power. Uh, you actually need to generate faith yourself, right? Although it's Amitabha Buddha's vows, but we actually, the, the metaphor is like, you actually need to go into the lift. Like Amitabha Buddha already provided a lift here for us to go straight to the 100th floor. But you need to be willing to go into the lift because you believe it. You need to be willing to press the 100th floor and you vow to go. So yes, in a way, it, and you need to be willing to practice yourself. So we cannot eliminate self power, although, when we go to the Pure Land, is we rely on Amitabha Buddha's power, but that's not to deny the cell power as well. So sometimes I see maybe some kind of an extreme interpretation on the Pure Land Dharma where they only completely talk about Amitabha Buddha's power and then they don't actually talk about any of uh, the personal effort. Uh, that can also be a little bit dangerous uh, for people maybe think, oh, I just don't need to do anything. I don't need to even have faith. I don't need to vow. I don't need to practice. A little bit dangerous. So true power methods, yeah. 
if you do not have a sincere mind, what happens is say, if you kneel for diligently, right? In your heart, you have a bit of doubt. Maybe you don't believe so much, but because you kneel for so diligently, you somewhat believe, you somewhat don't believe, you have doubt, and then you're gonna land in uh, a place next to the pure land. <laughs> And then after 500 years, you will be born in the pure land. So they will have a bit of a transition process. It's also mentioned in the Infinite Life Sutra. Okay, wonderful. So I'll see you guys next Saturday on the rebirth case, which I'll be sharing. And then next Sunday, we're gonna talk about the middle level of rebirth. So thank you everyone. I'm Itofo.